you. I'm so excited to be here. I've been to um, the Lincolnwood Library in the past in person, and maybe uh, some of you might have met me there or maybe not, but uh, things are strange in the world these days, and so we're, I'm so happy and grateful that we're able to still meet and uh, talk about books and reading um, online. So it's not the best, but it's it's a good it's a good option. It's a good alternative. So I'm Sadia Faruqi. I'm the author of a lot of different children's books, and I'm going to talk to you about them a little bit. I have a little presentation about myself, my writing journey. Um, <clears throat> if any of you are writers, uh, you'll be interested to hear some of my writing process today and some tips that I give to writers who are just starting out. Uh, then I'll read a little bit from uh, my newest book, and uh, then I will answer all your questions. So um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat, or you can, um, you know, ask me personally. Uh, but just hold on to them till the end, and I will get to them. I'm not going to talk for very long. So I love, I love ask, uh, answering questions. So um, okay, so let's see if we can get this screen share. There it is. Okay, I guess. Um, did I do, is it sharing? Yes, it's, show, okay, it's showing. Yes, I, I had forgotten if I had to do something else or not, but I guess, you know, I didn't forget. All right, so um, yeah, that's me, I guess, you know. Um, so, little bit about myself. I like this picture, even though she doesn't look anything like me, but um, it's kind of, you know, all the stuff that, that this lady is having, it's, it's very familiar to me um, and probably is to a lot of you, um, juggling a lot of things like family and work and, and um, just, you know, fun stuff to do your, on your own. But um, so I wrote down a few things that make up me, right? I'm an immigrant. I was born in Pakistan. I came to the US in uh, my early 20s. So it's been kind of half and half now where uh, half of my life has been spent in a totally different place with different culture and traditions. And the other half of my life has been spent here in the US. So uh, as I'll talk a little bit more later, I that is, that's kind of these two parts of me that make up a whole me. and that make up my writing. So when I write, I put a lot of those different traditions and cultures, it's my own um, individuality in, um, in my work, in my books. And uh, hopefully that is something that my readers appreciate. So um, I'll talk to you more about that. I'm also a mom. I have two kids. My son is in high school and my daughter is in middle school and they are both um, doing virtual school this year. Um, it's interesting but i'm very grateful that they are older so i don't have to really be you know tearing my hair out trying to figure this virtual reality and virtual school and virtual life uh, because they're old enough to to do that for themselves so i have a lot more time to write now than i did but I actually started writing with my um, kids were very young in fact my daughter was in kindergarten before that even when i started writing seriously um, obviously, I'm a writer as well that I'll talk about later, but um, the last thing um, that I am is a public speaker. So I'm actually an interfaith activist. I have been since oh, since I first came here to the U.S. And, um, you know, for the last couple of decades, I've been doing programs and events and trainings and all kinds of small and big um, uh, activism uh, programs. So it could be a book club that I started with a friend in my community that's been going on for more than 10 years now. Uh, it could be training my local Houston police department. It could be a lot of, um, you know, uh, visiting people's places of worship or their, um, their, their uh, schools, just talking to each other about different cultures, different traditions, sharing, learning, because I really feel that we need to learn more about each other, learn more about somebody who is different from us, and um, find out when we do that, we ask questions and we tell people about ourselves, uh, we find out that we're not that different. There's so much that we have in common. There's so much that um, we share in the human experience, even if we look different or we speak a different language um, or we, um, you know, have a different uh, faith. 
And I put all of that in my book. I talk about that, I write about that, and that's really important to me. Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know where Pakistan is, I put there's that little black um, star. Um, so I was born there, it's in Asia, I came to the US um, when I was 22 years old, and currently I live in Houston, Texas. So I have lived in other places in these last couple decades. I've lived in um, Cleveland, Ohio. I've lived in uh, Orlando, Florida. I went to college there. I've lived in Tennessee. Uh, but really, Houston is my home. This is where I've lived the longest and raised my kids. And so it's really fun because it's a big immigrant community here. And uh, we really um, pride ourselves in being, you know, a city of people who are from all over the world. And it's it's really fun. It's really cool. If you have, haven't visited, once things go back to normal, maybe you can and you will love it. That's me. When I was, uh, I want to say maybe eight or nine, I was probably in third grade in this time. And I think that I like this picture because this is around the time when I really got into writing. So I've been writing since I was a kid. Obviously, I never showed those writings to anybody. I used to have notebooks and I would scribble in them. Sometimes it would just be like, you know, journal entries, writing what was going on in school or at home or what I was feeling. Um, sometimes it was just stories or poems, mostly stories. I wasn't a big poet, but um, just a lot of imagination. And I would hide them somewhere. I don't think anyone knew that I was writing. I had my um, you know, I, I, I don't think my mom even knew, but now I feel like moms know everything. So maybe she didn't know, but she never mentioned it. So um, I would always be writing, but I never thought that I would, this could be a job. I never thought this could be something that I could do in my real life um, when I grew up. And it was also not in Pakistan and still isn't in a lot of um, South Asian communities. Uh, writing or creative arts aren't really um, given a lot of importance. So, you know, I never thought this was something I do. And so I grew up, I moved halfway across the world, um, did other things, but at the same time, I was still writing on the side just, you know, for fun. And it wasn't until much later as a grown up, as a mom, that I realized that, okay, you know what, maybe I should be serious about this because so much has changed in my life. But the one thing that hasn't changed is that I'm always writing and I'm always reading. So that was something that I kind of came to much later um, in my life. And, um, you know, never look back. But that's why I think this picture is really special to me <laughs> because it's like, you know, this little girl, she didn't know that she would be a writer one day and writing books that people were reading, writing books that people were checking out from a library in America. It was, it, you know, I wonder if she had known. She would be like, yeah, no, not happening. You're kidding. So but I like that. I, I like thinking of myself as that. So these are some of my books. You might know them. You might know the Yes Meme series. As kind of, I'm kind of better known for, for these books. Um, it's a series for those of you who are new to my work. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about all my books. Um, so the Yes Meme series is an early reader series. It is, I want to say between kindergarten and second grade is the, is the good kind of age that kids uh, enjoy reading these. But of course, if you have older kids, who might be say ELL or ESL readers, or um, they're just reading at a, at a lower level, they would enjoy this too. I actually have a lot of adults who like these books only because it's they read with their kids or their students and they enjoy them. Um, it's the story of Yasmin, who is a Pakistani American girl, um, like uh, my kids. And um, she is, um, in second grade, she's got a family that's loving. She has a mama and a baba. She has a nana and a nani. Those are all the words for your um, grandparents from your mom's side. And um, she, you know, she, it's a regular story about a second grader doing fun things. Like you can see, she is being, um, she's building something. She's pretending to be a superhero. She's cooking something. So in every Yasmin story, she fails at something. 
And then she tries again and again, and sometimes she comes up with a creative solution, and sometimes she figures out it's okay if she fails. So it's um, it's it's a there are twelve books, like I said, and actually in January there'll be four more, so we're gonna have um, sixteen in the series now. I'm ignoring um, Etty. My little screen is showing a lot of chat, so I'm like, uh, I hope no one's trying to get in touch with me while I'm talking. <laughs> People were just sharing. Sue shared that the books are not just checked out in ki by Kids in America, but libraries in Japan are checking them out too, the Yasmin books. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And so you're international. Um, and Miss Ann said that um, she loves the Yasmin books, even though she's, she's a, a little older than second grade. So yes, we okay, all love yeah. Yasmin. I found a little flashing and I was like, I don't know what's going on. So thank you thank you for sharing that i do know there so they're also available right now in french and spanish so um you know i i really love that as well because that kind of opens up how many kids can read them and if you have a kid who's older but they're learning english but they're spanish speaking or um french speaking i i was just talking to a, a school in canada this morning so you know i've never seen the spanish uh, the, the french books myself but i know that there's uh people who are interested in them all right so um but even though I'm better known for this series because it's really popular, I actually write other books for older kids as well. And these are two books that are middle grade novels that came out this year. I had two books come out this year. Well, I actually had six books that come out this year, the four Yasmin books and then these two. Um, so it's been kind of a crazy year in the middle of a pandemic and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about these and then you know, hopefully share some of my my um, feelings about them. So, okay. So, um, this one, A Place at the Table, is a middle grade novel that I actually co wrote with my friend Laura Chauvin, who's also a middle grade author. And it's a story about two girls. Um, Sarah is a Muslim American from, uh, with parents from Pakistan. And the other girl, Elizabeth, is a Jewish American with uh, her mom being from England. And so these are both first generation kids who are um, friends. They're in a cooking club together that's run by Sarah's mom because Sarah's mom is a, has a catering business. And um, they become friends and there's a lot of like tension in the community. There are people who are saying not very nice things to Sarah's parents and herself. And Elizabeth, the, the um, British slash American girl has to learn to stand up for, for her friend. And it's a book that's really fun. There's a lot of food in it. There's a lot of, it's a friendship story and it's um, really nice and warm, but it also teaches kids how to be allies and grownups, how to be allies, how to, when you see something happening with somebody, uh, it's not enough to just be quiet. Yeah, you have to stand up, you have to learn to stop that, even if, um, you know, even if you're scared. So that's uh, why we wrote this book, really perfectly aligned with my mission of interfaith activism and how we need to get learn about people who are different from us and make friends with them. With them. Um, so Laura and I have worked really hard and written this book together. And I'm hoping also if any of you are in, you know, teachers or librarians, I really think that it's a book that um, is one that uh, can have discussions around it, book clubs around it, talk about, you know, what it means to be friends with someone who's different and how you are more enriched because of that and um, learn so much, but also have fun. Um, my second book that came out this year is A Thousand Questions. And, oh my gosh, this is the book of my heart. This is the book that is really, so it's, it's set in Pakistan where I was born. And um, that's why it's special. I put a lot of my memories and my feelings and my emotions and things I used to do as a kid and things I remember in this book. Um, it is the story of two girls, again, a friendship story. So Mimi is an American girl who's um, a Pakistani American girl. And she has been dragged to Pakistan to visit her grandparents for the first time by her mom. And she hates it. She doesn't like anything about it. She just wants to go back home. Um, and, but she meets Sakina, who is the servant in her grandparents' house. She's the daughter of the cook. And she is 
exactly Mimi's age and and Sakina is just you know kind of tired of this spoiled to rich American girl who she has to serve and take care of so they don't like each other but they're the only two kids in this big mansion and nobody's really uh, you know into them the other people are just you know doing their own things and they finally become friends um, they go oh I saw somebody holding my book I love it um they um start to explore karachi so which is the city that this book is set in so you see a lot of the sights and sounds and um you know the tourist places there's a lot of conversation about different things that are important um to me um and they realize they both have dreams that kind of seem impossible but if they work together they might be able to help each other so mimi's dream is that she's looking for her dad her dad um, had left them when she was little and she writes um, letters to him in her journal, but she does, doesn't know where he is. So she wants to look for him. And Sakina's dream is that she wants to stop working in somebody's house and go to school. But she can't because A, she keeps failing the English part of the test because she doesn't know English that well. And also she's worried that if she leaves her job, how will her family survive because they rely on her income so they both help each other and they become friends and then you have to read the rest of the book to find out what happens but um i mean i'm saying it obviously i'm gonna say it it's a good book but i hope that you all read it uh, i put a lot of really important things things that are important to me personally in this book and um also my my background and my culture and my heritage in it so um, I hope you check that out. It just it just came out this this month, earlier this month, and I'll I'll be happy to answer questions about you know why I wrote this book and all that stuff in just a little bit. So I'm going to tell you about my writing process. Um, this book actually, you see, Yasmin the writer came out this year, which is kind of perfect for explaining any writer's writing process. In this book, this is one of the newest Yasmin books. Um, Yasmin has to write an essay for school and she is just stuck because she doesn't have any good ideas and everybody else in her class has great ideas and they've already done their essays and she's just sitting there trying to think, which is kind of what we all as writers go through. So um, yeah, so read that book if you want to know how to get good ideas, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, getting good ideas is hard. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to do a lot of thinking. I spend a lot of time, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, coming up with good ideas and I write them down. Um, I also brainstorm, I ask other people, I ask my family, my friends, what do you think I should write about? Um, I have a running list in uh, a document on my computer that goes back years and years. And every time I'm stuck with ideas, I go through it. And sometimes I pick up an idea that I had, you know, five years ago. Uh, so you never know, write down everything because you don't know it might seem like a silly idea right now but you might come up with a good story around it later um this is my little office and um i write here um writing for me is a is a job like i get up in the morning i write uh, you know in between doing other things and um sometimes i'm the, here the whole day writing talking to kids online um doing other kinds of stuff uh, but writing, when I get, when I have my first draft down, then I do a lot of revising. Revising is really what makes you a writer, right? Anyone can write things, but when you get to revising and improving and working on it and, you know, rewriting stuff, that's, that's really the difficult, but the, the good part of writing, because that's what makes you a real writer. That's when you have a good product, a, book, a good story at the end, because you worked at it. Um, getting published is hard and, you know, you can ask me questions about that later, but really once you have a good story, sending it out to publishers, if you want to, if you're a kid and you want to get published, you, there are a lot of writing contests, there's a lot of kids magazines that you can submit to, but honestly, uh, there's a lot of frustration in the writing process. Do you have to wait a long time sometimes? Like if I write a story and I submit it, it might be a couple of years before I see it actually in a book form. So it's, it, gets, it gets hard, but you have to, you know, be patient. Um, there's a lot of rejections. Even now as a published author, I write things and sometimes they don't get published. Sometimes nobody wants them. So uh, knowing all that, 
is really important because that's all part of the writing process. None of it is easy. None of it is, you know, just a snap of your fingers, but because it's hard and it's, but it's still fun because of that, you kind of, when you, your book is out um, or your story is published somewhere, then you feel really good about it. So, all right. Anything else that I need to stop for, for the chat, or I wanted to read a little bit and then we'll do a question. We'd love to have you read a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm going to look, I love reading from any of my books actually. Last time I was at the library in person, we read from a Yasmin book, but today I'm going to read from a thousand questions. And I know even if you, some of you are younger, you will, it's, it's really easy to understand. Um, so I'm going to read that. Let me actually stop this. Yes. Okay. Great. So this is what I'm reading from, a thousand questions. Um, this is dual perspective. So it means that one chapter is written from Mimi's point of view, and then the second chapter from Sakina's, and then back and forth. So I'm going to read from chapter seven. Chapter seven is Mimi's chapter, The American Girl. And this is very early in their friendship. So they are just, it's like just been a few days. They're still learning about each other, and they don't like each other much. So I'm just going to read maybe two pages and uh, hopefully that will give you a little bit of a, a feel of what the book is. Chapter seven, Mimi, my fruit is better than yours. The servant girl is chopping a vegetable of some sort in the breakfast area when I go downstairs to get a drink of water. I think it's a squash, but I can't be sure. Everything is different in Pakistan. The cantaloupe I ate last night for dessert was white instead of the melon orange I'm used to, and the taste was almost tart. The peaches are smaller. The bananas look smaller, softer, blacker versions of ours. So far, America won, Pakistan zero. Unsurprising. The kitchen is big and airy with windows on the back wall <clears throat> showing glimpses of the garden. Two stoves are lit, each with a pot of something boiling, contributing to the humid air. The servant girl, her name is on the tip of my tongue, has a long braid tied with a yellow ribbon at the end. She's wearing a faded pink shilbar kameez with sleeves rolled up in a way that make it obvious her clothes originally belonged to someone else. She she's tied her dupatta around her waist like she's about to wrestle. Good morning, I offer in English before I remember that she speaks Urdu, Gur. Asalaamu Alaikum, she says at the same time. I want to shout Jinx, but I doubt she'll understand. She couldn't catch most of what I was saying the first morning we got here. I walk to the fridge and open it. I hardly ate any lunch, even the chicken nuggets were spicy. It's only our fourth day in Pakistan and I'm sweating tiny streams from my forehead. Mom says I'll get used to the heat in no time if only I leave my air-conditioned bedroom. No, thank you. I'd rather get used to the little boxy air conditioner under my window that blasts icy air onto my face when I stand in front of it. Right next door to my bedroom is Mom's, the one she used to sleep in when she was my age. She's shown me every corner of that room with excitement. The wall where she pinned posters of a boy band called Janoon, the closet drawer where she, where she stashed all her cassettes of Indian movie songs, the balcony she used to sit on reading romance novels in the afternoon while her parents slept, you to the last one. I can't get over how rich she used to be. Not anymore though. In Houston with me, she's just average, <clears throat> getting by. Starving artist, she sometimes says jokingly. What a change that must be. Does she secretly hate her life? Does she wish she was a rich Pakistani again? Is that why we're really here? I peer into the fridge as if it holds the answers to all my questions. Do you need something? The servant girl asks from behind me. Sakina, that's her name. Um, Coke? I turn around and mutter, trying to keep my words to a minimum to avoid making a mistake in Urdu. Then I smile, hoping she'll help me. Sakina sighs noisily and stands up, raking her chair on the tiled floor. 
She walks to the open fridge and point. In the last shell, she tells me very slowly as if I'm a stupid kid who can't see properly. I look at where she's pointing. Oh, the Coke cans are right there in the front. I take one and go back to the kitchen table. Can I sit here? I ask hesitantly. I'm pretty sure I said that correctly. No grammatical mistakes or anything. She frowns. Why are you asking me? I'm just a servant. This whole house belongs to your nanny, so you can sit wherever you like. I understand that loud and clear. Wow, she's mad about something. I almost run back out of the kitchen, but I need some privacy, and this is the only place nobody will look for me. A few hours ago, mom even barged into the bathroom while I was doing my business, demanding to know if I had diarrhea. I screamed. Listen, I try to smile. Where I come from, we don't have servants, or at least my family doesn't. My friend Zoe has a um, cleaning lady that comes in once a week, but that's not me. I'm so proud of having said all that in Urdu. I smile at her, but all I get in return is a stare. She doesn't care. I sit on the chair farthest from her and take out my journal from under my arm. I ignore Sakina and begin to write. So, that's just a little kind of taste of, you know, how they start out, their friendship is, it's not a friendship right now, um, but you can tell, you know, what they each think about the other, but it's going to change. Once they become friends, it's, it's going to change. Their understanding of each other will change, and I think that's how I am with all my stories, where it, which are friendship stories, especially for middle grade, where I want my readers to understand that when you first meet somebody, you might really think they are weird or awful or strange or just not going to be your friend. But you have to give it time and you have to get to know the other person better and try to find something that you have in common and then you'll be really good friends. So that's that's like my, my little um, passion project <clears throat> in everything I do. All right. So that's all that I have. Uh, let me see if anybody has questions that I can answer. Feel free if y'all want to um, unmute yourself um, and ask a question. You're welcome to yep. use the chat if you want. You're welcome to use video if you want or not. You do what you're comfortable with. Or you can, again, you can message it to us and we'll ask the question. Um, so, yeah, about yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone's looking at the chat. So if anyone, yeah. if there are questions in the chat, can you read them out? Well, haven't gotten any questions in the chat specifically yet, um, but we can give people a couple minutes. I'm curious. Um, I guess I'll ask a question yeah, <laughs> um, sure. since I have the mic. I'm really curious about what you learned from writing a place at the table with <laughs> with Laura and how you applied that knowledge to writing a thousand questions or were you writing, writing them? I know like the process of publishing versus the process of writing, were you writing them at the same time? Like, I feel like there's a lot of obviously parallels. You have two voices here created by two creators. You have two voices here created by you. <laughs> so I'm curious, like yeah, that transfer, yeah. like a crafty sort of thing. I learned a lot writing a book with another person, especially with Laura, who was way more um, experienced than I am. I was just starting out in writing and she had already got two other books published. So, uh, you know, she was like my unofficial mentor originally. I looked up to her. And so I learned a lot in the writing process about writing, about writing with another person and how when you write with another person it's not just your story so you have to give up some control which was really hard for me so i learned a lot in that i really encourage you know if you're a kid um in school or anybody who's into writing try doing a project with another writer because even though it's hard and challenging you learn a lot you learn a lot about different ways of doing something and you can kind of it's, it's a good um difficult but good uh, exercise. So I did, uh, I learned a lot from her. Um, I don't remember, I think that I, we had the first draft of the story done. And then, um, no, actually, we had half of the story done uh, while I started writing that one. So yeah, I usually do multiple projects together. Right now I'm working on like five or six books together and different stages. Some are ideas, some are revisions, some are, you know, in between, so, yeah. 
Oh my goodness. So many more things to look forward to from you. Um, yes, welcome new most friends. of them are secrets. So oh. I can't oh. even share. That's what happens. You can't share all this good stuff that's coming until your publisher gives you permission. So. Once the news is out, we will be super celebrating and buying all the things. Um, it looks like we do have a question um, from Ikra. Um, what... Uh, did you write first and then pitch to publishers or did you send your idea to an agent and then start writing once they were approved? So um, now I have an agent, everything goes through her. So what happens now is kind of different from how I started out. Obviously now, now I'm at that space where everything I write, I might have a new project that I write. And, and once you have an agent, then you should actually be running your ideas before you start writing, because if they feel like they, it's not a good idea, then it'll be hard for them to sell that book to publishers. Um, but when I was starting out with the first book, um, with the Yasmin books, I actually wrote a book and then I went around and I tried to find agents and tried to find publishers. It took me a long time. I think it took me uh, close to a year to find an agent and then um, you know then things happen quickly because um, technically if you know anything about publishing you can't really um, the bigger publishers they don't look at your work unless you're agented so if you want to be self-published or if you want to be published with a really small publisher you can do that on your own but I don't even recommend that because then a lot of companies try to take advantage of you. Like my agent does so much negotiation of the contract, you know, the thing she wants what's best for me. So when we, when a publisher gives you a contract, you don't really know how to negotiate. You don't know what, what you don't have that power. So I always recommend um, to go that route. Um, but yeah, it was hard in the beginning, but now that I'm settled and I have an agent, so it's much easier. Yeah, thank you. They said uh, that helps. So that's very good insight. Um, and certainly if any of you are thinking about kind of that process, there's lots of great resources out there. I definitely would, um, and maybe um, Sadia, maybe you can speak to this also, like kind of like resources for people who want to get published, things like SCWI or other yeah. the Society of was it Book Writers and Illustrators as a resource to help um, get into the, the field. Um, yes. Definitely. Um, I think that it's always good to do your research, um, you know, uh, talk to other writers who are starting out, but there's a lot of, you can just search Google how to publish a book and then a lot of different sources come up, a lot of it. So, so, so you know, deciding which route you want to go, whether you want to do traditional publishing versus self, they're very different in terms of, you know, how you go about it, what you need, um, how your books are received. So, um, but there's, but, but I learned like that, right? I learned when I was starting out by just talking to people, but also reading up online, reading books, joining organizations, getting together with other writers that were starting out so that there was like a support system. That's really important. Um, so yeah, it's out there. You just have to like do the hard work of researching and learning. Absolutely. Um, a couple like process questions. What is, what are, um, Meg wants to know, what are your writing times during the day? And I imagine obviously that has shifted a lot um, as we talked about before, but I guess, I guess to add to that, do you have like a structure, a process? Are you um, like an outliner versus a just like kind of throw it on the page kind of person? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, definitely the timings have changed for me. So um, before, when I got serious into writing, so, you know, in the beginning when you're starting out, it's mostly another thing you're doing in addition to your job or your, your other stuff. Um, but so, but now for the last several years, it's been like my, my job, my work, this is what I do. So I've had to have a schedule because otherwise you just don't, you can't have enough time to do all the things that go. Because, you know, for a published author, it's not just writing books. It's marketing your books. It's making, you know, online, spending a lot of time on social media, connecting with people and trying to promote yourself online. Um, I, today I spent a whole, and actually every day I spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time talking to schools on virtual visits when before the pandemic, I was traveling a lot. So there's a lot more than just writing. So I have to have a schedule. Otherwise I would never get anything done. It's changed slightly before it used to be, I would drop my kids off to school and then come back and that was my work day and then I would stop um, to pick them up around two 
So that was the time that I work now because they're in virtual school. It's more, um, and they're older, like I said, so I don't have to worry more about like sitting with them and figuring the computer out and things like that. So um, really I can work longer, but it's still the work day, um, unless there's a deadline, in which case there's <laughs> just, just writing all the time. Um, I am very much a plotter. I'm, I'm very much a, a control freak, so I have to control every aspect of my writing. Um, I actually outlined very heavily before I start writing, not the Yasmin books, the Yasmin books are easy because they're, they're not easy in any way except that they're smaller, so I don't have to do the outlining. But for middle grade, I do have, I do like chapter summaries, I do the whole plotting, I know exactly what every chapter is going to be and then I start writing. So, but I know a lot of writers who are not like that, you don't have to be like that, it's, it's very much what works for you. And it might also change, you know, I have a lot of different projects, so it's helpful for me to have those outlines so that I don't get confused and, you know, start writing a, the wrong character in the wrong book. That would be a disaster. <laughs> I would love to see, like, some crossover fan fiction. Oh, my gosh. With Yasmin, <laughs> meeting Mimi. Yeah, and that's really hard. I mean, that's, that's really the trickiest part of children's rough any writing. Um, is the voice, right? If you, I know a lot of times we we feel we're good writers, but we really have to do a lot of work in understanding voice and character, which is which is really craft. You know, you have to just do it and take classes and and learn and write a lot of stuff before you get a handle of that. So yeah, I was working on the Yasmin books versus a picture book versus um, a chapter book series that I'm working on. And the voice just had to be slightly different because the age is like slightly different, right? Seven versus five versus 10. And um, yeah, you have to, it's, you have to be very careful. So, um, but it's, this all stuff you can learn. I learned it, right? It's not something you might have the talent for writing, but it's still a lot of it is from practice and taking classes and improving yourself. So anyone can really get better at it. That is really great advice because sometimes it feels a little overwhelming and it's like, you, it's a craft, it's practice. Um, it is, it really is. But um, I think the danger is that a lot of people think that they're really good at, they're a good writer and they don't need all that. But I, I, I don't think so. I don't think that anyone can just be a good writer with, before doing a lot of work on it. Um, it looks like you answered a bunch of Gus's questions already um, about sort of the craft. I want to go back to Jaya and Anisha's question. They said, we love your books and the topics you write about. Um, what do you think is the hardest part about being a writer? And what would you recommend to kids who like to write? It sounds like you've covered a bit of that. Um, but I wanted to make sure I asked their question. Uh, what's the hardest part about being a writer? And what was the second one? So the hardest part about being a writer and what would you recommend to kids who like to write? Mm, yeah, I don't know what's the hardest part. It depends on what I'm working on. Um, I actually, I know I saw in the chat something about a graphic novel, which I can't really say, but I might be working on one of those. I'm not technically allowed to announce that. But, um, you know, if anytime you work on a format that's different from what you're used to, that becomes like a hardest thing for, for me. And um, it, a, a lot of times the hard part is just sitting and writing the whole book. You might have an amazing idea and then you outline really well and you're super excited. And the first few chapters are always fun to write because you're just starting a new thing. And then they get to like maybe chapter 15 and then you just want to throw it away because now it's the middle and you have the whole rest of the book to get to and you just want it to be over. So actually doing that you know, that work of every day sitting down. And it takes longer if you're not a full-time writer, right? If you're writing, if you have another job and you're writing just on the weekends or just at night, then you're looking at months and months of doing that. So I think that just the work of it sometimes gets hard. And um, the way that I actually um, stop that for myself is that I have multiple projects. So I can always switch. Oftentimes I switch things in the same day I'm working on multiple things. So that stops me from getting bored. Um, advice that I have for, for kids is really write a lot, write regularly, have a notebook or, um, you know, um, 
document on your computer and make sure either maybe, I don't know if every night may not be even possible, but maybe on the weekends, every weekend or every few days, write something. Um, write a short story, write a paragraph, write something very regularly so that you get in the habit of it. And um, you could uh, find out if there are any contests. Sometimes public libraries have writing contests. Sometimes your school might, sometimes your teacher might have a competition. Try to um, submit to as many as possible, even for grown-ups, even for adults, anyone starting out, that's really good, important to do. Um, chances are you're not gonna win anything, but it's going to help you not only become a better writer, but it's going to help you manage rejection because rejection is really such a big part about being a writer. And that's a lot of times that just like kills you because you can't understand how people, I mean, it's just, it's so crushing, right? So you, the, the e, earlier you get used to that rejection, the better it is. And, you know, you always, even if you don't win anything, you're still writing, which means you're still improving yourself. That is great advice. Um, it looks like, let me just see if the questions I missed. Um, um, so I appreciate you commenting about writing contests. I will try to find some research, y'all, and I will include that in like a blog post about this event to share some resources with you for like international um, writing contests and local contests. We could certainly think about doing one at the library. Um, I think that would be a really wonderful thing. Um, yeah, and you know, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge contest, right? If you are a teacher, you can have a contest in your class. If you're a librarian, you can have one in just your library. I think that's just giving those opportunities to young people to get in the habit of being professional about something, being organized about something, about wanting to complete something. And you don't have to be part of a big group. You can just do it in your local. I remember when I was a kid, in, um, and I, I have three, we have three sisters, so me and my two sisters, we would actually have competitions amongst ourselves because we all, all three of us loved writing. And um, so, you know, one summer we got really bored. I think we were teens and we said, okay, we're each going to write a story about the same topic and then we'll like judge each other. And <laughs> guess what? I lost my sister one who is now up in finance. So she's not even a writer. <laughs> but, um, so I guess what I'm saying is that it, you don't have to, you know, your library or your school or your teacher can do things like that as well. Absolutely. Lots of opportunities for creative writing and sharing that out and finding audiences for it. Because that's a big yeah. part of it, I think, too, is like creating a thing and having somebody else look at it is yeah. part of the like act of being a writer. Um, Oh, Gus said, did your other sister become a writer? The <laughs> no, no, one of my sisters is a doctor and the other one works at a bank, so I'm the only like, writer. So you don't know, you never know. And, and you can still be a writer if it's not your real job. I feel like if you're regularly writing, you don't have to be a published author. You can still, you're still going to call yourself a writer because you're doing it. I love that. I also love claiming that identity that is meaningful to you. I love yeah. that. Um, um, Jaya and Anisha have um, another craft question. Do you like to write on paper or do you usually just do it um, digitally? I am totally digital. I actually, even when I make my grocery list, I type it out. I'm just that kind of person I don't like writing on. I don't know why. I don't know. I mean, like I grew up without, you know, that computer is like my I start, we, the first time I used a computer, I was in college, so it's not even like, I, that's the only thing I know, but I just, I like, I like the fact that I can just delete stuff, and it doesn't look messy, um, but you know, it's okay, I mean, everyone's different, and if you, a lot of authors I know write with paper, so, yeah, no, Gus no said that. In that at all. And it's all what works for you. Gus said that yeah. he, when I write my book on paper at night, I add that to the typed version on my computer. I love that, Gus. And also, I love that you're writing a book. We need to talk oh, more yeah. about that. That sounds awesome. Good job. <laughs> um, there was a question earlier um, about um, moving to the United States and Pakistan and just the, um, I guess, the, the, your journey process. And I'm, I have a question kind of taking off of that, writing um, a thousand questions and going back um, and like do, having that journey with your kids. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, like writing from a, a perspective of the past, but also the present. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's actually a good question. And I've, if you read the book, there's an author's note at the back. And that explains why I wrote this book, because being an, uh, an American author, I think that there's like most books that we write, all of us are, are set in the US. It's hard to find a market for books that are set in other countries or, or a lot of kids will be like, why do I even care about this? Why am I reading this? So it was a very personal reason for me. Um, I had gone to visit my mom. My mom was having surgery a couple of years ago. And so I had decided I took my both my kids for the summer to stay with her to just take care of her. And we had not visited for a long time. We used to visit like regularly when my kids were little and then we stopped um, for a lot of reasons. And then so this visit was when they were, I want to say, um, you know, 10 and 12 or 10 and 13, something like that. So they were much older and they were seeing Pakistan for the almost the first time like that they remember. They had seen it as babies, but they, did, they didn't remember much about it. And it was just fascinating to me because for me, it was like a homecoming, right? I was coming back to a familiar place, but it changed because obviously I hadn't been for a while, but it was still familiar and I didn't really notice a lot of stuff. It was just home, but not really home but I noticed that they had a totally different reaction, right? They were, they hated everything. It was too hot and the food was too spicy and nobody understood what they were saying and they couldn't talk to anyone because they didn't understand, they, they didn't speak Urdu. And it was a frustrating time for them, but it was also like something that they were connecting with. I could see it in their faces where for the first time they didn't stand out, right? They didn't look different. They, everybody looked like them. Everyone's mom was wearing the same clothes and it wasn't something that was embarrassing. Everyone was speaking the same language. Um, so I could feel that kind of like push and pull uh, to my kids. And it was so different from what I felt um, that I just, I had to write it down. So I ended up, my mom uh, doesn't remember, but I told her recently, you know, that when I would sit at next to you, like at your bedside in the hospital, I had my laptop and I was writing and she was like, really, is that what you were doing? I don't know, because she was like half the time on meds. And I'm uh, like, here's the book that I wrote while I was supposed to be taking care of you. But, um, you know, that's how I am as a person. When I see things um, that are interesting to me, I have to write them down. And a lot of you, if you are writers, you probably have the same thing where that's how you process. And um, that was important to me to kind of, I wanted to know what is it like for kids who are first generation and they go back to what is their homeland, but they really don't have any connection to it, except for what they've heard from their parents and grandparents and their parents and grandparents expect them to just love this place and don't understand why they couldn't care less because obviously they're not from there. It's, it's, it's a very strange situation for kids like my kids to be in, and, and that's their identity, um, which is kind of like a hyphenated, fractured, not really belonging anywhere kind of identity. And I wanted to, I write about that a lot in all my books, but this was special because this was like the back home experience that, you know, a lot of kids do have, a lot of us have um, as well. Thank you. That's really powerful. Um, I have a question from Sue. Um, is there a chance that A Thousand Questions will become a series? Um, I would love to read subsequent books set in different locations. For example, maybe in an international school. Sue teaches in an international school as librarian. Oh. And I would love to see the girl's relationship and how it, change, how it changes. Um, ah, no pressure. I've never thought of that before. I don't know. You know, I'm the kind of writer, I get, I get not bored, but once I'm done with the book, I'm done with it. I don't want to revisit those characters. <laughs> a lot of people actually, not about this book, but said about my other book, A Place at the Table, um, that will be there be a sequel of the two girls because of, you know, they're in a community and they're, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I mean, there are no plans, but the one thing I have learned in my life is never say never, you know, because you never know what's going to happen in the future, but not really, it wasn't planned as that. Um, and usually with these books, we have contracts with publishers. So we already kind of know, um, you know, uh, I can tell you what, um, there's another book that's coming out next year. It's totally got nothing to do with this, but um, if you'd like, I can share that. Yes. All the books by you. <laughs> oh, well, Please there's do. a lot. 
that I'm working on, but the one that's kind of done and ready, um, uh, my second middle grade, well, third, is going to be coming in September of next year. <clears throat> and it is actually <clears throat> a 9-11 book. It's a story of 9-11 from the perspective of a Muslim American, uh, which is um, we already don't have very uh, many 9-11 books for kids. And then we always have missing the perspective of the people who were, who are Muslim, who whose life completely changed um, after 9-11 in this country. So it's actually... Um, it's a story of a boy. It's called Yusuf Azim is not a hero. And it's a story of a, an 11 year old boy who is going through the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And there's a lot of hatred in his community, a lot of not only kid bullies, but adult bullies who are bothering the Muslim community in his little town. Um, he's trying to grapple with that. And um, he reads the journal of his uncle who uh, um, from 20 years ago, who actually went through 9-11 as a kid. So it's kind of like dual perspective, but also dual timeline, uh, 20 years apart. And um, it's kind of a serious book, but I think you'll like it. I try to make my serious books also fun to read. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. We are very excited for it and we'll definitely be purchasing it for our library. Um, oh my goodness, y'all. It's already 4.30. <laughs> this time flies. Um, oh my God, there's so many questions. I love it. <laughs> um, do you have a couple more minutes for a couple more yeah, questions? I do. I do. We kind of started late too, so that's okay. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm reading the, the chat myself. Oh, sure. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Ahead. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm, I need you to still tell me what where we are. I can do that. <laughs> Um, so we know we're going to have a couple more Yasmin books in the winter. You said there are four more coming? Four more ones. They always four at a time. Uh, so four more Yasmin books in January. Yeah, yeah. It's almost here. Can I just say how excited I am for Yasmin the Librarian? Like, I cannot even tell you all how excited I am. I saw a cover um, reveal on uh, um, Edelweiss. I don't know if it's public yet, so I didn't want to post anything, but like, I am here for Yasmin being a library helper so much. Yes, so. And, and I wanted to do a librarian book because I want to, it's like my thank you to all the librarians who have just loved the series so much. Honestly, the reason why it became so popular is because of teachers, school librarians, and public librarians who just like kind of promoted it and loved it and and handed it to kids and I just appreciate that so much yes so there's Yasmin the librarian Yasmin the scientist Yasmin the recycler and a finally very cute story Yasmin the singer uh, which is very cultural she goes to a Pakistani wedding and there's like a there's it's it's like just full of, of um, South Asian culture and wedding finery so I'm, I'm excited, yeah. That probably was really fun for Hatem Ali to illustrate, like to bring I that to so. life. <laughs> like he'll let you know. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm sure he has fun doing it, but um, with those books where it's more cultural, like which, which one else had it? There's Yasmin the Chef, which is a little bit more cultural um, and couple others, I think he has to make more sure that he's not making any mistakes. I had to go back and, you know, um, uh, tell him that this is how Pakistani dresses are. You have to make them very matchy matchy and, and, you know, the color coordination has to be like really amazing. So I guess I think he learns a lot from my little lessons. I don't know. <laughs> Right on. I mean, I think that's what's so powerful. Um, yeah, no, I'm excited that in that book, so that one is going to, um, in Yasmin the Singer, on the cover, you are going to have Yasmin wearing a traditional dress that we called a garara. And I don't think I've ever seen that in, in an American book. So I'm so excited because she looks so adorable, just like my daughter used to look when she was little. Um, but it's just, it's time we had people wearing, you know, their own cultural dresses, but being proud of it and on the covers of books. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. We definitely need to do something in January, y'all, to celebrate the release of all these books, come together again, yeah. like somehow or other, because <laughs> I'm so excited. I hope all of you are really excited. Um, I had another question from Jaya and Anisha. Um, 
since you work on multiple projects at the same time, do you try to spend equal amounts of time in each of your projects or do some of them get like more attention or time than others? Or is it sort of like, my brain is here for this project today, so that's what I'm gonna work on. I yeah. added that part. <laughs> I wish I was that organized. Um, I what happened? What ends up happening is that it depends on how where my deadlines are. You know, um, if something is coming up soon, I have to work on that more. Um, and if something is coming up six months from now, then I tend to not work on it until it's more urgent. Um, it also depends on. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, it's hard to say, you know, any given time. I don't think it's ever equal. It's never equal. And then a lot of times I end up not working at all. I know that I have like 50 things that I have to do, but we are trying to promote the UK launch of a thousand questions right now. So that takes priority. So it's really not, I'm not writing anything the way I need to because I need to promote this book. So any of you, if you know anyone in UK, tell them to buy my book. It's going to be available in uh, the UK in on November 12th. And then after that, it'll be Australia, New Zealand in December something. Wow, that's amazing. We'll definitely do what we can to find our UK <laughs> friends. Know where anyone's relatives live, right? I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's the cool thing about all these virtual programs that we have like international friends who come and join us and connect with us. Sue said that she's pre-ordered Yasmin the Librarian for her school in Japan. So Thank um, you. <laughs> we definitely will be as well. Um, Gus wants to know, would you be a librarian if you were to li a writer? Or would you Ooh. other career paths? Yeah, I don't know what I would do if I wasn't a writer. I mean, I did have other jobs before I decided this is what I was going to do, but they were always writing related in some way. Um, I For the last 20 years, I've been a grant writer, which is kind of like the boring kind of writing, but very important. So um, I would actually not have minded being a librarian, but again, growing up in Pakistan, we didn't really have those career choices. I mean, I could have if I had researched, but it wasn't really something that was promoted. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess I would just be sitting reading books. I would never get any work done if I was a librarian. <laughs> I would be like, you know, hiding in behind a shelf. No one bother me and probably get in trouble. So maybe not, maybe not the best thing for me. Sounds like the right thing came your way. <laughs> Becoming a writer was the right choice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would rather, I would rather be on the other side. But, you know, with, for, for, for us, we're all one industry almost, you know, we're like, I'm, I'm one part of it, but you librarians are one part of it and the bookstore. So we all work together almost to, to bring out this, this, this kind of output, this product, which, you know, people enjoy and, and hopefully like. Absolutely. The interconnectedness you really feel. Yeah. Um, I love that. Um, question from Sue is if she organized an international author visit with you would you be able to do this again and over zoom for her students overseas and oh, I can yeah. I do that all the time absolutely so um, I will Sue I'll connect I'll send you like Sadia's author visit information if that's helpful for you Sadia whatever you prefer yeah you can visit my website it has um uh, visit information and the school visits tab. I don't know how the timing would work out but, you know, we could even do like a recording that you can show later. I, I did. I remember doing one with kids in Hong Kong one time. It was like really middle of the night. And that's fine. I mean, I love that. You know, once in a while, if you have to kind of give up your, you know, I mean, that's part of being an author. So, yeah, definitely reach out. I would love to talk with kids in Japan. I didn't even know they, they knew about my books in Japan. So I'm, I'm loving that already. I am so pumped for that. Um, maybe we can come to that event too, Sue. <laughs> um, get up very early on our side. I want to make sure I point to our independent bookstore, which is booked in Evanston, but you don't have to purchase it from them. If you are elsewhere, you can purchase it, purchase Sadia's books from your local independent bookstore to support them. They need our support, um, especially right now. If you have, um, holiday plans, buy books early, They're, they make the best gifts ever. Um, it is now 4.40. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, please support yeah. your indie bookstores. 
uh, some, if you buy from my, uh, I'm not, you know, booked Evanston is wonderful and I love them. But if you do want signed copies, my local bookstores have, does have copies with my signature on them. Uh, but if you buy from anywhere and then you contact me through my website, I can sign a book plate and send and put it in the mail for you. So, but you don't, I don't know if some people like signed stuff. So, you know, if you want that. Um, that from Blue Willow Books? Yeah. Is that your local book? Blue Willow or Bra Brazos, both of them um, are my local in Houston and both of them have, you know, um, yeah, in fact, I had a teacher who wanted to buy a whole bunch of books for her different cli classrooms and so she made a, a she booked she bought them with brazos and then they contacted me and and i have a whole list that i have to go and sign all of them for her specifically for her class so i love doing that i mean you know that's not even a problem so but uh, you know whatever whatever you buy whether it's my books or anyone else's i think books make great great gifts and also as a reminder our indie bookstores are really struggling so if you can buy from them rather than online please please do that um, and, you know, support our local bookstores. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I am so grateful uh, for this amazing event, Sadia. Thank you so much. Round of applause, everybody. Feel virtually or otherwise. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Um, if there are any fun, yay, like the emojis. If there are any final questions before we say goodbye for now, um, so I want to make sure if everybody has any final thoughts. If anybody wants to come on camera and show if they have a copy of any of Sadia's books or just say, come on camera to say goodbye, that's fine. You do what you're comfortable doing. <laughs> oh, that's the one. That's another. I did not even know it was purple from inside until, you know, my daughter was like, what is this? That's so pretty. Well, I, never, I never want the cover so pretty. I never want to destroy it. But, but I will say, I will say that the cover of this book is really special. Um, it actually has all the buildings that are actual buildings in Karachi. I don't even know when I saw this cover for the first time, I started crying. These are the, the artists. Um, her name is Alia Jalil, and she's a fantastic artist. Um, she did all, these are actual buildings all around Karachi. And um, like this one, is uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. I went to a convent school and this was outside my school. Every day I used to pass by it. Um, you know, I can like tell you what each of these are. So yeah, I know that sometimes the, the dust jacket, jacket kind of gets annoying and you just want to take it off. But for me, it's really special because it's, it's got meaning, you know, it's got like, um, the cover has meaning. I feel like this would make a really gorgeous like read poster like when ALA oh. does those like just seeing the girls there with the backdrop so yeah and if you read the book they actually go to all these some of these places so you can I've had a lot of readers tell me that they actually felt like they were visiting Karachi because I've just like described it because it's like I don't know my love was coming out I guess <laughs> You can definitely tell from this beautiful book that it's, it's full of love. Well, thank you so much um, for everyone uh, who listened and, you know, uh, supporting me. I really feel very grateful to have people in, in the community who are here to, you know, come to my events and read my book and, and um, share the books with other people. So thank you for doing that. Sadia, you have another event this week with Laura, right? Do you want to, not to put you on the spot, but do you want to share about that? Not to put you yes, on the spot. So, <laughs> um, either, right? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, it's actually on Instagram Live. So if any of you are on Instagram, you can join us on Friday at, I believe it's 5 or 5.30. Just go on my Instagram, which is just my name, Sadia Faruqi. We're going to have an Instagram Live uh, about Halloween which um, in a place at the table, there's actually a very, like a couple chapters dedicated to Halloween. And since it's coming up in this story, uh, Sarah's family does not celebrate Halloween. And I know a lot of kids growing up here have questions. Um, I know in my family, we don't celebrate. And my kids, when they were little, they would just be very upset because they, why were they not allowed to? So me and Laura are going to have kind of just like a discussion about what our different traditions are. She is Jewish. She also, you know, has traditions that are different from a lot of other people. So if you want to come and listen to us, 
on Instagram Live until Friday uh, and, you know, talk to us, send us questions. Um, we're just going to, you know, talk about Halloween and all its various facets in American society. That sounds fantastic. Um, we'll definitely share out that link so people can um, come join. Um, Fine. <laughs> we could talk all day, but we all, some of us have to either go to work or go to sleep or <laughs> do other things. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadia. Thank you all so much for joining this wonderful program. We will post a link to the video in the near future. Um, keep an eye on our website. We'll do a blog post with all these resources and information there once I, I write it. <laughs> um, but we will say goodbye for now. And thank you. Thank you so much, Sadia. This was wonderful. Thank you all so much. Keep in touch and let us know what else we can do to support y'all during this time. Yeah, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, we'll see you all soon, maybe in person one day. Yes. Yes. Bye. Absolutely.